I've never been to the Musée du Monde, mais oh, le Musée des Arts de oui, certainement. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love it. It's wonderful. It's so yes, I think the Musée du Monde uh, is quite little exposition only because when I went, I went twice and there isn't a uh, permanent exposition. Yes. The yeah, only, uh, when was temporary. the last time you went? Last year. Okay, oh, that's good. You were recently. Because yeah. I, the reason I asked is I just read that they like revamped it. So yeah. I wasn't sure. You're right here. Yeah, because I, re I, I really um, yep, didn't we have see anything the that was clicker somewhere around only, here. Uh, temporary because the all the museums uh, that uh, are owned by the Prefecture uh, de Paris uh, are free. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, and like they are temporary. Oh, okay. Thank you for telling me that. I'm glad I know that. No, um, yeah, the 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 Musée de Um, I don't remember correctly. I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. Which I went to because. Yeah, the panel's being controlled from the rock panel. I was there, and it was the afternoon, and I just wanted to go someplace. Oh, that's Have you... Have you been to the Museum of Arabia? No. I could stay there all day. Oh, I get to know. It's a file, which is the case question. Okay. And then it's a little while to doing college, and it was... Oh, that's fantastic. Are we going in this order? Slow down. Yeah, she did it well. Um, it might be better. Alyssa, would you be comfortable starting us out? It's going to take a couple minutes for us to get the AV. If you would like to take the water, you'll be great. You'll be great. So I was going one, two, three, four. So we'll start with Alyssa and then we'll do William, Felicia, and then Alice. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Thanks. And I guess we'll pass the remote along. Well, it looks like they're getting the slides right away. Alyssa, would you feel more comfortable going last? I have no preference. Whatever's easier for everyone else is fine with me. Awesome. Either way, it looks like they've got the slides already ready to go, so totally up to you. Sure. <laughs> All right, well, if they've got William slides ready to go, then we'll just go in program order and start with William, and then you go last. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. Then I'm, I'm second. You're third. Okay, third. Okay. <laughs> Okay. All right. So um, <clears throat> we are continuing full bore ahead. Um, we've had a great uh, couple of discussions so far. Um, today, or right now, we're going to introduce a new part of our conference. Traditionally, um, the conference uh, organizers, my colleagues here, invite people individually um, to, to make presentations. And what we did this time, and I, I thank my colleague Andrew Robertson for overseeing this and thinking of the, the call for papers, is we said, let's see what we can, you know, we'll, we'll throw out a, a call for papers, we'll throw out a paper topic and see what comes in. And I think um, all of us who read the papers here were really um, delighted at how high the quality was. Um, and I must also say I was at conferences in both Vietnam and Canada 
um, over the summer. And at both conferences, at least two participants came up and asked me about this specific thing. So um, that told me that we actually are getting a global audience when we send out a, a call for papers. So um, with the internet being what it is, uh, we're no longer talking just to Ohio or to the US, but we're talking to the entire world. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Andrew Robertson, who will also do the introductions of the panelists. Thanks. Great. Um, and I'm going to keep the introductions very brief because we have a short amount of time. Um, but I do want to congratulate all the panelists here on doing really fabulous papers. Um, as Tim said, when we sent out the call for papers, we had no idea what we were going to get back. Um, but what we got back were uh, a number of really amazing papers, more than we could ever include today. Um, we had separate categories for students and then for faculty or practitioners. Um, our student winner here with us today is Alyssa Bickford from the University of Oklahoma, who did a wonderful paper on Nazi looted art um, with some really original thinking. Um, in the faculty and practitioner category, we had one winner who couldn't unfortunately be here today, uh, but Dr. Deming Leo from Newcastle Law School did a, an excellent paper on uh, moral rights in public sculpture. And although he's not able to be with us today, that article will be forthcoming in the Journal of International Law. Um, so please do look for it. Um, we also have three fabulous winners who are here with us today um, who talk about various aspects of ethics. It's, it's difficult, as you've noticed already today, to talk about art in the international law sphere without also talking about ethics. It, it infuses every panel. Um, but I'm, I'm very pleased to see some very thoughtful, uh, more directly focused on, more, very thoughtful work, very directly focused on the ethical aspects of both various issues in international law, like the return of cultural property and North-South cooperation, um, as well as the application of law and ethics in particular art spheres. Um, such as fashion maps, um, and in a forthcoming paper as well, public sculpture. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to the panelists. Um, we're going to start today with a presentation from Dr. Worcester uh, of Univer the Hague University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands, who's going to be talking to us about the role of the map in international law. Um, from there, we'll turn it over to Felicia Caponigri, who will be talking about the ethics of international display of fashion in the museum. Um, and then Elise Fabrice, who will be talking about cooperation of the North-South uh, on, on return of cultural property, especially focusing on the case of South America. Um, and then finishing things off with our student winner, Alyssa Bickford, who will be talking to us about Nazi looted art and preserving a legacy. Turn it over. OK, thank you very much. So um, what I want to talk about is maps. And I, at first, I suppose, let me see if this is going to work. There we go. Um, it's a bit of a weird fit, I think, with the, with the conference, because I, I think on first glance, you're like, well, MAP is not really, it's not a, an artistic product, it's a scientific product. Um, so the way I started off dealing with this question is to say, well, what do the experts say? So I looked up the Cleveland Museum of, of Art, and it turns out in their, their holdings online, they have lots of maps. And I picked, a, I'm going to use my fair use rights, and I, and I picked a, a few to, to show you. This one sort of doesn't look like what we normally think of when we think about a map. It's more of a kind of landscape. But it does have some, uh, it's a very realistic depiction, but it has some of these kind of fanciful things with sort of Neptune and these uh, ships that are completely out of, uh, out of scale. But they classify this as a map, and, and they keep it within their holdings. Here's another one that I kind of liked. It's a much more realistic depiction um, of, uh, of some territory. But um, so it has this kind of um, scientific aspect to it, but it has a, 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 an artistic aspect to it in the sense that certain choices are being made and certain things are being excluded. Where are all the Native American population, for example, is the first thing that comes to mind, right? Boston's labeled, but where is everything else? Here's another map that they, that they have in their holdings. Uh, again, this is a sort of very realistic depiction, um, shows a sort of coastline, that kind of thing. But you can see that the, the, it's, it's a naval battle that's being shown here. And you can see that the, that the city is highly abstracted. So you have just these kind of rough buildings, because that's not really important. What's important um, are the ships. And of course, the ships are also very abstracted, because they're kind of triangles or whatever they are. They're not very realistic, and they're out of proportion um, with, the, with, the, with the city. But that's not really the thing that's meant to be communicated with this particular map. What's communicated here is the various positions and, and, and what the strategy was that was going on there. So the reason why I included all those, well, and I'll show you the modern map, of course. So then we switch to from this historical 
um, uh, view of maps and questioning, are these sort of artistic or are these scientific, just sort of a modern one. And this is what we're all very used to. This is a, a highly representational, very realistic map. But then, of course, we all are very aware of the shortcomings of Mercator projection. And you know, why is Greenland the same size as Africa? And is that sort of a bias implicit on the global north, et cetera, et cetera? So it has a realistic aspect to it and also has an unrealistic aspect because it's, it's focusing on communicating certain things and not communicating other things, excluding other things. And this one I just show for fun, just because I think it's hilarious. We're, we're all very used to the sort of map of the London Underground, which is a map, but is also totally unrealistic because it has nothing to do with London. Everything is mixed up in different places, but it is representational on where the different stations are. This is the, the map of the Tokyo transport system, which in some ways I find even more beautiful than the London Underground system. It's, 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 it's stunning in my view, but also completely unrealistic, and yet at the same time, realistic in terms of comparing where the different locations are. So that's a bit of a sort of a funny way of introducing my speech. Um, so I want to talk about then, are these things scientific or are they artistic? And I think that they, they sort of bridge this gap. On the one hand, they, they have a scientific side to them and they have this artistic side to them. And what I want to do is identify what are the different roles that maps are playing in international law and then speculate what is this sort of hybrid art, science, nature, how is that playing out in international law? And I want to talk about four different areas. The first is the use of map as evidence, the use of map as a fact, the use of map as, as a legal act, or the use of map as law, that is, and the use of map as an imagined reality. So when we talk about fact, when we talk about evidence, really we're talking about two different things. We're saying on the one hand, evidence of facts, and on the other hand, we're talking about evidence of law. I'm gonna talk about the evidence of law a little bit later, but in terms of the evidence of facts, this I think is sort of our normal, and I'm not gonna talk about this very much, but this is our sort of normal understanding of what we do with maps in this kind of environment. We get them, we know where the different locations are, distribution, et cetera, et cetera. It's not particularly um, complicated in my view. And we have you know, evidentiary standards to go with that. But when we talk about uh, something as evidence of law, that's a little bit more tricky because there's sort of two different ways that it's being used. One is evidence of whether or not you have a legal obligation in place. That is, is there a sort of binding instrument that creates a legal obligation? The other question is, are, what's the content of that particular rule? And I think maps are used in, in, in both of these ways at different times. So when it comes to the, oh, let me go back. When it comes to the, the legal instrument, knowing whether or not you have a legal obligation in place. And we usually measure, if we're, if we're legal realists, that is, we would all measure whether you have a binding legal obligation by looking at um, obligation, precision, delegation. And I think that the map can play a role in all of these kinds of things. If you enter into an, an MOU, but if you don't include a map, do you include it as a document that then has some kind of persuasive authority that this is supposed to be a binding instrument, so on and so forth. When we look at it from the question of what's the content of the rule, this again is a little bit more familiar to us because we could look at a map as a sort of preparatory work, we could look at it as subsequent practice, that kind of thing to get a sense of what is the content of the particular rule. But maps are often submitted as evidence of claims by states, evidence of what they believe the legal outcome to be. So if a state is submitting a map that has borders, well, borders aren't facts, really. I mean, borders are legal conclusions. So what they're doing is they're making a legal assertion there. So when a state presents a map and it has an artistic depiction on it, a line, a dash, different colors, overlaps, what exactly are they communicating in terms of a legal conclusion? So this is, and I hope you can see this. I know that, that I'm, I'm sort of technologically challenged, but this is, of course, the nine dash line. And you see the dashes going around. We've all seen this many times before, but what's not really clear from this is what's the legal conclusion that's being asserted? We have a sort of sense of what it is, but is this, uh, it, it, are the dashes meant to represent what? That this is a, a, a sort of net in which all of the bits of rock uh, China has sovereignty over them and then they produce their own zones? Or, is it, or are they saying that the dash is a sort of a sort of sovereignty line and they have sovereignty in those particular, it's not completely clear to me what they're, what they're trying to do um, with that. And that's inherent in this, in this sort of non-linguistic uh, um, artistic depiction. 
Add to that the complication of private actors. So you have non-state actors, usually a company or something like that, that will produce some kind of a, a map. And they will then have their own depictions on top of that. And they will have their own sense of what is the legal conclusion here if we're trying to figure out what the content is. So somebody dug up out of the Yale library this map and is now using it to sort of position against the nine dash line to say, here's a map that was drawn up long, long ago by a company, by a private publisher that doesn't show any South China Sea, that shows the full territorial extent. And so somehow that's a sort of competing legal claim coming from a private actor. And this was a bit of a source of a diplomatic incident because I love this picture. This is, this is Merkel showing to the Chinese president. Um, this is a, a map of China that has no South China Sea. And apparently they didn't vet that before the meeting, so it turned into this huge diplomatic incident. Here's a map coming from Google and Wikipedia. You can see that they've just made their line where they're going to put their line. If you go into Google Maps, most of Google Maps when it comes to borders are pretty bad, actually. And you can see that they've depicted the line in the, in the temple site between Cambodia and Thailand. And they've depicted it in their own interpretation of the law. And uh, of course, the states have complained. Why would they complain about a private actor? Apparently, they think that it's communicating something important. The map can also be legal fact. And what I mean by this different from evidence of a fact is that is the existence of the map or the creation of the map, could that be in itself triggering law, maybe a violation of the law, something like that. And I'm thinking about the, um, the, the Firem uh, Greece case, the interim accord case at the ICJ. And the problem was that maps were being made that communicated the name of the country and in communicating the name of the country, that was seen as, what, a threat? A threat from one country to another one to, to annex their territory? This is a commemorative coin that was produced um, in Russia, fairly recent coin. It's actually about this big. But it was produced in Russia. And you can see on one side, we have Putin. On the other side, we have Crimea. So they're putting, in, apparently, on their currency a map, which is a claim for a legal position. In addition to this, we have the draft articles on state responsibility, which say you're not meant to recognize an unlawful situation. On the left is the official state map of Israel, which is very different from the American CIA map. So if we're under a legal obligation not to recognize something as unlawful, what kind of legal obligations do we have to map correctly, certainly when we're, when we're mapping by a government authority? The map could also be law. And this is sort of, again, in two different ways. It could be that the map itself has legal value. The ICJ has said that maps themselves intrinsically don't have legal value, like a treaty would have legal value. But if a map is attached to a treaty, usually when a map is attached to a treaty, there's some proviso in it that says this is uh, for illustrative purposes only. But that's not always the case. Some treaties will make reference to the map as an integral part of the binding text of the agreement, which all of a sudden to me has very different implications. It could be that a map is attached to a judgment. Usually that's not the case in terms of making it legally binding. It's usually not part of the dispositive. It could be that a map becomes binding through rules of estoppel. This is precisely what happened in the Temple case. Map was produced. We expected a reaction. We didn't get the reaction. It could be that a map is potentially a unilateral statement. This is, I think, a little bit harder uh, argument to make. But indeed, we could make the argument that in producing a map, you are either uh, recognizing something or making a concession about something. If indeed a map is a binding legal obligation, then the problem is how do we interpret it? All of a sudden, the, the document itself, the picture that's been artistically depicted, has legal meaning. And what do we do to apply that? Do we apply the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties interpretation methodology, which doesn't really make any sense? Going back to the question of how do we interpret a dash? What is a dash? The last thing I want to mention is this effect on the public imagination and how we create a new reality by using a map. 
Now, I, I'm going to set aside New Haven School because I'm not a big fan of that, but I think you can probably guess the implications uh, of, of applying that perspective using a map. What I want to think about is more of the Benedict Anderson approach of using a map to, to, to construct a new reality and why it is that some states will do this on their flag. What are they attempting to achieve by depicting a map on their flag? Are they trying to sort of create a sort of state? Are they trying to consolidate a state? What's the statement that they're trying to make there? I heard a story about this map, which is, this is the map that was produced during the negotiations of the Oslo Accords. Um, the PLO and Israel had negotiated the agreement and basically were about to sign it, but no one had ever made a map of what A, B, and C zones would look like. So finally someone at, in, in the Israeli uh, ministry said, let's make a map, and they presented this map to Yasser Arafat, who said, negotiations are over because you're trying to destroy us. Why would he do that? How is this different from the text? The text tells us exactly what A, B, and C is. And yet, strangely enough, this communicates something different because how does it depict the reality, which is slightly different from the text? The only last thing is, and I see a, a, a note that I have to stop here, so I'm going to respect that. The only last thing I'll mention is the, is the invasion of Goa, which if you look at the text and the discussions at the Security Council, the way that India invoked the territory of Goa and the way that they imagined Goa as being already an inherent part of their state, even though there was no India at the time of the independence of Goa, and I can only speculate, but I can only guess that if you look at a map of Goa from space, what do you think? Of course, looking at the map makes you think the Goa is part of India. Of course it is. And doesn't that affect our public imagination for that? So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a slideshow that I sent. Is it listed on here? Yeah, there we go. No. No, 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 I sent it to Nancy. No, that's not it. It's the fashion one, cap and agree. Yeah. That's it, number two. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so today I spotlight fashion's common presence in the museum that transcends geography and legal jurisdiction, jurisdictions and how it's not exempt from the ethical challenges and proposed solutions that accompany the presence of art in the museum. Fashion magazines play a role in the sponsorship of fashion exhibits. Fashion brands manage their own, quote, museums. Members of the fashion community serve as trustees to museums that put on fashion exhibits. And what I'd like to propose is that the ICOM code provides a ready solution to these ethical issues. First, I'll address the ICOM code itself, how it binds ICOM members, its status as soft law, and how its general conflicts of interest standard seems at least on its way, perhaps, to becoming a rule of customary international law. Second, I'll explore the Met's 2015 costume exhibit, China Through the Looking Glass, through the eyes of the first Monday in May documentary, addressing how Anna Wintour, who is a trustee of the Met, artistic director of Condé Nast and editor-in-chief of Vogue, seems to follow ICOM standards in at least two instances. Third, I'll explore the Gucci Museo in Florence, Italy, entertaining whether it is a museum under the ICOM definition and discussing how its management by Guccio Gucci S.P.A. and its former director, Frida Giannini, seems to indicate a tendency to subsume any museum interest into business and personal interests, which seems contrary to the ICOM code. So you may ask at a wonderful conference on the art of international law, why care about fashion? Well, my answer is that allowing museum professionals to perhaps opt out of minimum ethical international standards just because they are displaying fashion compromises the public's ability to appreciate certain items of fashion as part of our own cultural heritage and to truly accept fashion in the museum space. So ICOM. ICOM is, of course, a non-governmental international public interest organization founded in 1946. It has more than 35,000 museum and museum professional members. And the ICOM code establishes minimum standards for professional practices and achievements for museums and their employees. 
members of ICOM commit to respect the code. And the code highlights, among other things, the duties of museums to preserve, interpret, and promote tangible and intangible heritage, and that museum professionals operate in a professional manner. The ICOM statutes contain the following definition of a museum, which I've placed up here on the slide. And as part of the principle that museum professionals act in a professional manner, the code contains a section devoted to conflicts of interest. After specifically addressing specific circumstances for museum professionals, the code contains this general catch-all provision. Should any other conflict of interest develop between an individual and the museum, the interests of the museum should prevail. The code defines a conflict of interest as the existence of a personal or private interest that gives rise to a clash of principle in a work situation, thus restricting or having the appearance of restricting the objectivity of decision making. And the definition of cultural heritage in the code is tellingly broad. Anything or concept considered of aesthetic, historical, scientific, or spiritual significance. And this broad nature of heritage is reflected in ICOM's international committees. In fact, ICOM has iCostume, which is a forum for members who manage apparel. Now, this terminology that iCostume uses actually includes fashion, and it reflects the evolving nature of fashion's place in the museum. Of course, the term fashion is fraught with conflicted meanings. We see fashion as an ever-changing seasonal object, which belongs in storefronts and commercial venues, but clothes from Zara, as we can see from this Tweety Bird clutch, and H&M to Giorgio Armani and Versace Ready to Wear all do have a social purpose. And the same social purpose, when viewed objectively and historically, can provide a methodology of analysis and scholarship. It grounds fashion's inclusion in the museum space with the perspective that fashion is a nonverbal visual communication, a way to solidify group identity. Fashion can be a container of meaning, and contemporary audiences can learn about societies of the past through it. And iCostume's use of the term apparel in its mission statement embraces these uh, varied meanings. And here's a map <laughs> um, in keeping with the other panelists. Um, museums around the world display and collect fashion. And while the ICOM code applies to ICOST, ICOM museum members, it also extends beyond. In fact, the ICOM code has been included in UNESCO's 2015 museum recommendation, which incorporates the ICOM museum definition and encourages museum states to use the ICOM code as a reference for national museum standards. Other evidence also points to the fact that the ICOM code standard, that when there is a conflict of interest between the museum and any, any individual, the interests of the museum should prevail, might be on its way to becoming a rule of customary international law, which is defined in Article 38 of the Statute of the ICJ. So items in the press do indicate an opposition when museums appoint individuals who are perceived to have a conflict of interest with the museum and also affirmative actions on the part of museums to address them. For example, we can look to Jeffrey Deach's appointment at the Los Angeles Museum of Contemporary Art and then a 1930s example of the art dealer Lauren Devine having to resign his position from various London museums. While the need for an absolute prohibition on the dealer as trustee, as John Henry Merriman has discussed, seems to still only hold most sway as a strong academic suggestion, the general belief that museum interests must prevail when dealing is involved is a policy staple. As far as the fashion world is concerned, the easiest mapping of the dealer as trustee would be for fashion designers to be like art dealers, since fashion editors technically only promote fashion. Even when dealers are not involved, however, the public still perceives these conflicts of interest when writers and publishers of magazines are too deeply intertwined with exhibitions. For example, when InStyle sponsored the Armani retrospective at the Guggenheim in 1999, and when Random House, a fellow subsidiary of Richard Avedon's employer, The New Yorker, published the catalog of his retrospective at the Whitney in 1994. And these same critics were quick to note that a 1997 show of Versace's work at the Met was paid for in part by Condé Nast, publisher of fashion magazines like Vogue that depend on Versace for advertising. And interestingly, in response to these concerns, the Met's president of communications said this, before Anna Wintour had been uh, elected as a trustee of the museum. Quote, we are very upfront about this. There's no question where the curatorial imperative lies. These shows are curatorially managed and conceived, and the funders do not attempt to have any input on the installation of the exhibition or the selection of the items that go on view. 
in terms of state practice, uh, while the types of legal entities assigned for museum governance do differ across jurisdictions, um, the standard that in a conflict of interest situation, museum interest should prevail over individual interests does seem to be common across different jurisdictions. For example, in the United States, the majority of museums are subject to laws governing charitable institutions, which include fiduciary duties. The New York uh, State's Nonprofit Revitalization Act of 2013 expressly requires that nonprofit institutions have an established conflict of interest procedure and policy. And the New York Attorney General has explained that circumstances giving rise to conflicts of interest may also arise where an issue comes before a director or a trustee individually. Of course, disclosure is primarily required in these situations, so it may then be decided what course is in the best interest of the nonprofit, often a museum. In Europe, where museums are traditionally state-run, regulations of conflict of interest that occur in museums can be even more in line with the ICOM code. For example, in 2015, very recently, Italy adopted a full-fledged reform of its state museums, and they incorporate the ICOM definition of a museum into the Ministry of Culture's recommendations. Um, and in addition, they have also um, incorporated the ICOM code in a, in a 2001 Recommend, uh, recommendation, regulation, um, regulating the um, behavior of directors um, of state-run museums, which might apply uh, to private museums. So now let's turn to our two examples. Uh, the first one, China through the looking glass. So as an institution, the Met requires a great deal from its trustees, and Winter's participation in the organization of China is in keeping with this Met tradition, especially of fundraising, which is also in keeping with the ICOM code. Um, when conflicts of interest are strictly construed, they are characterized as arising in a transactional situation, not simple sponsorship as Condé Nast, Winter's employer, provides. This narrow view of conflict of interest seems to lead to a broad museum interest. If the trustee has no potential direct personal financial interest, then the museum's interest might potentially be satisfied, even if an individual interest is satisfied as well. Um, but, and the ICOM literature does characterize sponsorship as a business relationship. But under the ICOM Code's catch-all provision, um, conflict of interest is defined more broadly, indicating a narrow museum interest, where it seems less likely that the museum's interest can be satisfied alongside an individual's. When helping with China, Winter certainly champions fashion uh, in the museum. For example, she helps uh, Andrew Bolton, the curator, navigate the perilous political waters evident in the exhibition of certain items of Chinese dress. Um, but she does serve two masters. Winter has an interest in throwing the best Met Gala possible, both for the museum and to further her own business interest with Condé Nast and her personal brand. The Met Gala has been referred to Anna, as Anna Winter's party, even though it's the Met Gala. Um, so to give one specific example um, of Wintour's behavior and how it seems to be in line with the ICOM code, when she is confronted with the value of Tiffany Pillars in the face of table organization, she grounds uh, her decisions to move a table close to the Tiffany Pillar in, in the reasoning that it's actually not about art tonight, it's actually about raising money for the museum. Um, and the ICOM code seems to walk a fine line between narrow and broad understandings of museum interest when sponsors are involved. While they define conflicts of interest broadly, the ICOM code classifies sponsorship as transactional. Um, and so what it's, it seems as though um, for um, members of the fashion community who are involved in these fashion exhibits, what is ethically advisable is that they walk a fine line when involved with museums that display fashion, being careful to ground their own reasoning in what is in the museum's best interest and not their own or their magazines to be in line with the ICOM code. Our last example, the Gucci Museo, is an opposite example. The museo presents objects that are not necessarily items of cultural property under Italian law, and yet classifies them in its museum labels as heritage. Moreover, the museo's status as a nonprofit entity is questionable. While museums are not strictly money-making enterprises, the Gucci Museo is managed by and is a department of a for-profit corporation. The Gucci Museo display and exhibition also point to a museum mission that is not solely in the service of society or with the purpose of education, study, and enjoyment. More than simple sponsorship, Gucci Museo is an extension of Gucci itself. Even though its products are a part of Italian history and Italian culture, the close connection between the for-profit fashion company and this museum space seems to imperil an appreciation of the museum object as heritage, leading to a negligible education appreciation of the actual difference between a current Gucci product for sale and a historic Gucci object in the museum. 
Of course, there are similar aesthetic experiences between a luxury brand goods store and um, the Gucci Museo, but museums are concerned with the public's interest, which may or may not support such a similarity of aesthetic experience. And in operating the Gucci, um, the Museo Gucci, Gucci, the brand, and its former director have essentially seemingly created the ultimate conflict of interest. Um, the business and personal interests of those in charge are essentially inseparable from that of the Gucci Museo and the public it should serve. In fact, Giannini decided to eliminate Tom Ford uh, from uh, the Gucci Museo upon its opening in 2011. For Giannini, the first designer to succeed Tom Ford, a display that emphasized the importance of Giannini's own evening gown designs next to historic Gucci objects, effectively elevated Giannini's work for sale at the expense of an accurate educational museum presentation that would prioritize Gucci. So to end, um, it seems as though the Gucci Museo example um, highlights that there is a conflict of in there are conflict of interest cases where even a broad conception of the museum's interest when fashion is in the museum would be ethically insufficient. Um, while Conde Nast and Anna Winter's involvement in China may raise ethical issues, in the Met example there is still a clear boundary line between the museum's interest and the people who manage it and arts trustees, and this these boundaries are what the ICOM uh, code emphasizes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I will speak about uh, the cooperation South South in the return of Kutur property. Uh, several cases of restitution of Kutur property, in fact, occurs between uh, the North, so-called North states, uh, and the, the, uh, the countries that of origins are so, uh, often the South Country states. So uh, this kind of uh, interaction between North South, some some authors says that the restitution sometimes are made by revenge or other interests that are not on the, um, uh, on the interest of the integrity of the good heritage of the South country. Uh, so I will, I will talk about uh, the illicit trafficking of Kutur property in South America, uh, some legal instruments that are applicable in this region, and the case of restitution and the case of return, restitution being the case of uh, restitution of Kutu property that has been illicit traffic, and the return is uh, concerning Kutu property that has been uh, withdrawn of its uh, country of origin um, in, in past, and there's not, it doesn't have a legal obligation to, to restitute. Um, the illicit trafficking of Kutu property is considered uh, the third main criminal activity, only be behind uh, the traffic of drugs and arms. And it has increased 500% in the last three years, according to UNESCO. And it's estimated to be superior to $6 billion in 2011. So it's a very big issue. And most of the countries that the scooter property came from are from South America, Middle East, or even Asia. Uh, there are several legal instruments that try to stop this illicit trafficking. The first one is the 97 UNESCO Convention, then it was updated by the 1995 uh, UNESCO Convention. There is a regional convention from uh, two Latin American states, that's 1972 San Salvador Convention. There are several bilateral agreements, and uh, I will study also some uh, declaration from the Mercosur and UNESCO that are regional, organ regional organization from South America. The 97th Convention is the first treaty that uh, treats solely with the illicit trafficking of cultural property. It has been signed by, um, uh, by almost uh, every country of South America, and it has uh, three major axes, preventive measures, that is, it demands the states to make inventory of cultural property, uh, and uh, restitution provision saying that if there is a cultural property that has, has been uh, illegally exported or imported, they should be uh, returned to the country of origin. And it's 
but this restitution is made by uh, international cooperation and n there isn't a firm legal uh, obligation. This is because to be applicable, this convention needs uh, to be internalized in the legal, in the internal legal uh, order of the state. In the sense, uh, there is several different interpretations of this convention and several laws depending on the country that you are uh, dealing with. Uh, the UNIDROIT convention tries to uniform, uh, try to harmonize those laws. It does not need uh, another bilateral agreement, uh, sorry, does not need to be internalized to be applicable. Uh, however, not all states has been uh, uh, ratified this convention, only 33, if I'm not mistaken, to this date. Um, okay. It complements the 97 convention, uh, it seeks harmonization between national laws, also uh, it defines a more uh, specific mechanism to the restitution. However, the two uh, innovations that are brought by this convention are the principle of good faith, that it is acquired the good faith. However, it changed the burden of proof. The acquirer must uh, demonstrate that he's bought in due diligence, that he has done some uh, research on the provenance of this, uh, of the cutter object that he bought. And also establish a prescription. You can only ask for a restitution for a cutter object in uh, 30 years from the discover that this illegal object is in the possession of another person. This is only applied for private persons, not to the public cultural uh, heritage, but it is an innovation of this um, convention. Also, we have the 1972 San Salvador Convention that was made uh, right, uh, right after the 1970 Convention of NESCO to apply this convention in the uh, America, in America. It's made by the Organization of States of America, American states are always, and it's not ratified by all states. Some state has, um, has some criticism of this organization since in its restitution mechanism, it's given uh, jurisdictions to national court to determine uh, the ownership of the cultural object. And some state, as Mexico, understand that this, uh, the jurisdictions to national courts uh, vi violate uh, the sovereignty of the states. Um, there, that is the mechanism for the restitution of cultural property from this convention. It has been a negotiation between two states. It has been made uh, by a diplomatic channel first then uh, can be brought by uh, to before a national court. Also, the Mercosul, that is a um, uh, regional organization between Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Venezuela, uh, has made some declarations for the to fight against illicit trafficking of cultural property. Uh, in 2012, uh, it created an ad hoc committee that to create an international database of stolen cultural objects of the states and uh, to create a specialized pol uh, policy force in this field for a more uh, specialized approach in the fight. Uh, also in 2015, uh, it, it created, uh, it uh, declared to create a near future an inventory of cultural property to raise awareness uh, within the states and others uh, uh, field. The UNASUR, which is a, is a more broader region organization, almost all states of South America are uh, part of this organization, has also made a declaration uh, to establish a working group to identify good practice to be applicable, uh, to be applied by South American states to prevent illicit trafficking of cultural property. Now I have some practice, uh, sorry, first, uh, the bilateral agreements. Also to fight against illicit trafficking of cultural property, several states has made uh, bilateral agreements to, uh, okay, uh, to, to establish a mechanism for restitution and a cooperation between uh, the states. Uh, these are the states that have made some bilateral agreements. 
Uh, the first interesting one is between Chile and Peru. It was made before the ratification of Chile of the 1970 Convention, which demonstrate that even if a country is not a uh, part of this convention, uh, Chile has a uh, interest in fighting against illicit trafficking of cultural property. Uh, the definition of cultural property uh, by this agreement is only uh, the def uh, is the definition of the state. It's not a definition between two states. So if Peru brought a claim that some uh, cultural object that is in Chile is Peruvian, uh, he said that uh, it's the Peruvian law that uh, can embase this definition, uh, this claim. Uh, the setup of dispute is by arbitral tribunal. However, the diplomatic diplomatic way is preferable. Uh, the second one is between Colombia and Ecuador. This agreement has been brought before the Colombian Supreme Court, and it, uh, the Colombian Supreme Court said that the fight against illicit trafficking is one of the principles that the Colombian government should uh, apply in, in its foreign policy. Since there's uh, the looting in, in the country is, uh, is enormous. Uh, I will bring now some cases of restitution that occur when uh, cultural property is removed illegally from its country of origin. Uh, the first one is between Chile and Peru. It's the application of the bilateral agreement between the two states. And they were uh, found uh, thanks to a partnership between the customs of uh, Chile and the university, the archaeological department of the university, that uh, when some uh, object are suspicious, they are reported to the university that uh, has given a, a report saying if the, the cultural property can be illicitly or not uh, uh, imported. Um, other cases between Chile and Ecuador, uh, when 115 archaeological objects belonging to Ecuadorian cultural heritage were seized in the auction house in 2001. Uh, also, the return was made by a domestic court, no, uh, and it took 10 years. And this is one of the uh, great, uh, great uh, criticism between this bilateral agreement is because when you are applicable to the master court, the, the time frame of the, the case is too big. It's 10, 15, 20 years to the cultural property to be returned. And when it's made by the diplomatical means, uh, and this restitution is made more uh, shortly. Uh, another case between Argentina and Peru, where more than 4,000 Peruvian cultural objects were seized and returned uh, in Argentina. Uh, the identification was also made uh, through a cooperation between uh, the customs and uh, university archaeological professionals. And, and also was made by uh, Argentinian court, uh, court. That's why this process took 10 years also to be resolved. And the, this court has said that uh, this object was part of cultural heritage of Peru, applying the law of Peru in this case. Uh, another interesting case is between Ecuador and Colombia. They have a very uh, intense uh, cooperation for the fight against illicit traffic. Uh, in 2015, uh, Ecuador has returned to Colombia the statue Santa Ana Triplice, and that was uh, identified as. Equatorian cultural heritage because it was uh, exposed in the Equatorian National Museum. However, Ecuador declassified this statue as its cultural heritage to uh, return to its country of origins, Colombia, which demonstrates a very uh, interest in Ecuador to uh, foment this um, cooperation between two states. Colombia also returned to Ecuador some cultural. Uh, heritage, this is a painting from one of the famous, most famous painters, uh, Equatorian painters, that was uh, found in an auction house in Colombia, and it was also uh, briefly returned to uh, Ecuador. Uh, also, when we we turn to return cases, when there's no legal obligation, when there's no um, when it's after, mostly, come on, after 1970, uh, because of the UNESCO Convention that established a legal regime for the restitution and for uh, prohibiting illicit traffic, even if before there were some rules, uh, it's more difficult to have uh, 
uh, this good faith return of crypto property as we see in the Parterre Marbles and others. Uh, and this was two case between Argentina and Paraguay, I see my time is up, and there's three cases. Uh, the most interesting was Chile and Peru, that Chile uh, returned several uh, books that were uh, looted from the National Library in their war in 1879 to 84. And it was, uh, the restitution was considered as a historical repatriation from both countries. And that's it. <laughs> So I wrote a paper about um, a specific case involving the University of Oklahoma. That's where I go to law school. And um, I actually had an opportunity to see the painting that the case involved because um, I lived across the street from the museum for a little bit. So it was really interesting. So I'm excited to tell you guys what I learned. <laughs> um, this is the painting in question. And I'm sorry, I don't speak very good French. So if I mess up the pronunciation, please forgive me. Um, but they called it La Bourgeoisie for short throughout the complaint. and. Um, Basically, it was part of a really beautiful collection of a prominent French Jewish citizen named Raoul Meyer uh, before World War II. And before the Nazis invaded France, he put his entire collection in a French bank to keep it safe, along with several other families. Um, however, when the Nazis invaded, they ended up looting his entire collection as well as other people's. Um, at the end of the war, several efforts were made to start returning a lot of these artworks that were discovered to the families and the rightful owners. Um, and Raoul Meyer submitted a huge inventory of all his works, but was unable to recover La Bourgeois. Um, and then in 1953, he found out that a Swiss art dealer named Christophe Bernoulli had possession of the painting, so he sued to recover it. However, the Swiss court determined that Bernoulli had rightful ownership to this painting. Um, Bernoulli offered to sell the painting back to Raoul Meyer, but she refused, and then um, Meyer did not seek a, an appeal, and then he lost track of the painting. Then in 1956, the painting showed up um, at David Finley Gallery in New York, and after the initial exhibit, um, the Weissenhofer family purchased it. Uh, David Finley was a really good friend of Clara Weissenhofer and had helped her accumulate a giant collection of French Impressionist art. And so when the painting was on display, he contacted her to come visit it, see it, and she fell in love, so she added it to her collection. Um, then in 2000, the Weissenhofer estate requested a $50 million gift to the Fred Jones Museum in Norman, Oklahoma. And um, it was still there this year, the painting. Um, but until 2009, there was no disturbance or anything. And then um, Raoul Meyer's granddaughter, Leon, found out through a blog post that this painting that was so important to her family was at the museum. So she sued to recover it. Um, and so her main argument was that the Fred Jones Museum did not do due diligence in determining the provenance of this particular piece um, because the Fred Jones Museum belongs to two particular organizations, the American Alliance of Museums and the Association of Art Museum Directors. And both of these organizations have ethic codes and standards and guidelines to promote good practice and kind of to do due diligence and to investigate claims for their existing like existing collection as well as future bequests. Um, so there's this ongoing responsibility to do provenance research. And then um, in addition, the Association of Art Museum Directors uh, released a report in 1998 um, to kind of address these concerns about Nazi looted art. Um, there had been a lot of national efforts in the 1990s in the US to address all these concerns because more and more pieces were starting to show up. And um, the, this report in particular, they refer to it as the guidelines throughout the complaint. Um, says that if a person brings about like a credible complaint to a museum about Nazi looted art, they're supposed to settle it in a um, equitable, appropriate, and mutually mutually agreeable manner. But there's nothing to really say what that actually means. So that would be one of the problems. Um, so that's her best argument. argument. <laughs> um, <laughs> the main 
Ms. Paul, with her argument, though, is that all of these guidelines and ethics and standards are all voluntary and self-regulating. There's nothing legally binding about any of them. And there's no legal consequences if a museum doesn't seem to uphold them. Um, so then the University of Oklahoma's best argument for why they should keep the painting was that this was already decided in the Swiss courts in 1953, that they shouldn't have to worry about it. Um, and so this case ended up settling back in April. And um, the main points of it go back to this equitable, appropriate, mutually agreeable. Since there's not a whole lot of case law and precedent to decide what should be done always in these cases, um, I looked at it through this lens that the 1998 report, these guidelines proposed. And so the terms of the settlement agreement in particular were that um, this year, the painting would be transferred to a French museum that both OU and the family agreed upon. And then after that, after five years, um, it would switch every three years between the University of Oklahoma and this museum. And then upon Leon Meyer's death, they would mutually agree upon an art institution in France to give it to so it could be displayed there. Um, in addition, both parties had to drop any pending litigation, as well as they both had to consent if they wanted to give any literary or movie rights or anything about this entire story to anybody. So to me, mutually agreeable kind of seems met just because there's a lot of communication going on about which one are we going to both agree that this is okay to do? Where are we going to display it? We both have to give consent to whether or not somebody can make a movie about our story, you know? And um, it seems to be equitable because they're both dropping any pending litigation, so there won't be any further costs or litigation or expenses in that sense. But um, like I said, there's not a whole lot of precedent on what to do. And since this is coming up more and more as more families are giving donations to museums, I mean, I don't see this problem going away. Um, and one of the big policy concerns is I mean, obviously you want to give emotional closure to all these Holocaust victims and their families. And people, I mean, people on campus, when they found out that this was an issue, were outraged. Like student groups were protesting the museum and like boycotted any events. Um, on one of the game days, they had students out passing flyers to like educate the public. They arranged for a plane to fly over before a game to like show a banner. It was a big deal. Um, but at the same time, museums have this great goal of like educating the public for a broader good. And they have the ability to house and care for some of these, ideally care for some of these great pieces. And so what do you do? Um, so in the sense of these two innocents, not always true, but I like to think some museums at least do the best they can and <laughs> try and take care of the art. Um, but I mean, one of the things that I thought about proposing a solution for this would be to propose some type of mandatory mediation or negotiation as a first step at least to get parties talking, to see how many pieces are being claimed that this happened to. Because especially if there's a lot of parties and pieces involved, it might be better to see if a settlement agreement could be um, met before in, you know, instigating all this litigation. Um, as well, I think that some of the, another pro for the uh, mediation negotiation would be it, re it might reduce backlash towards museums. Because some museums are doing a really great job, some aren't. And then, <laughs> so I mean, I think that was just a good idea. And statutes of limitation, I mean, they can only do so much. They're great for judicial economy and efficiency, but with claims like this, I mean, who's to say what's a long enough time to not allow someone to bring a claim? We're just now finding some of these pieces that because the Nazis destroyed the title and the records of these, like we're just now finding out. So is it fair to not let them bring a claim now? So that was just kind of what my paper was about, and I hope that you liked it. <laughs> We have uh, time for just a couple of questions, if we have some from the audience. Um, well, let me start with a, uh, a comment, maybe in a question for Elisa. Um, I really enjoyed reading your paper. Um, I teach international litigation in some years, um, and I show my students the woman in gold film, which I'm, I'm betting you've seen probably. <laughs> if, if anybody who hasn't seen it um, would really enjoy it, I think. Um, and one of the things that I really liked about your paper is you did have this focus on the parties coming together and being able to mediate. And I think in the, in the case demonstrated in the film, right, that was one of the things that wasn't happening. Um, the, especially the museum was very much looking at things through a lens only of the law um, and being very recalcitrant um, rather than coming to it from this position, like you say, of two innocents. Um, and I was wondering, you know, if you, if you are familiar with some of those other cases, um, is that a, do you have that sense of that was a contrast between the Oklahoma case that you looked at versus some of these other cases that have been in the news? 
I don't know about a whole bunch of other cases, but I know that in the, uh, for the Fred Jones Museum especially, um, I mean, one of her biggest claims was that it took nine years and then somebody was able to find a record or some type of trail to follow. And I know during the lunch panel, he's talking about how much time it takes and, you know, you start with a fact, figure out if it's fiction or not and go from there. So, I mean, I like to think, I mean, I like to be hopeful and think that there are many museums who are doing the best they can with the records they have, because especially now when you have email and all these great electronic databases, you'd be able to track better. But I mean, I don't know if it's always true that there's two innocent, but I don't know. <laughs> great. Other questions? All right, well, we can finish up um, and take a, I think, a brief break before the next panel. Thank you so much to this panel, and congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, if we could come back here in about five minutes, we're almost running behind and I want to stay um, on schedule if, if at all possible. So if you return here in about five minutes, that'd be great. Thank you. Did all of you get the notification about dinner tonight? I sure think, I did. I think so, but I don't know the details. Are we supposed to meet? Are we being bussed? Or <laughs> so it's actually right across the street at the art museum. Um, and it turns out that the email didn't go to everybody. So the conference organizers just sent it, I think, probably while we were on this panel. <laughs> so you should have more details about it now, but there's going to be a fun oh, presentation thanks, you know, at the art museum. The exhibits are going to be open, and then thanks there's a, a dinner yeah. in the restaurant there. And is, it, is the museum on Euclid? Or is it's it? on it's East there. Boulevard. Yeah, oh, it, is. it is right across oh, from the okay, law school. Okay, um, but people will be going over together in a group, so it should be pretty easy to follow. Stephanie, there's going to be a group going over to the dinner, right? I don't know about it, but I'll take it. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Please so don't. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I would, because you know what the thing that intrigues me about is what what did they intend to mean by doing that? You know, what did they mean for this to be a governing legal document? Did they mean for I mean, maybe they did? You know, but I, I kind of had a hard time believing that that was the case. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I think, I think in many cases we don't know, and then that becomes, and that was sort of what I was trying to get at was that we often have this sort of untrue value of it, you know. But yeah, look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I think these lines are, you know, I think they may the initials. Right, right. Imagine. Just some stones of. It's actually something I want to tell you. The signature's handwritten signature. I mean, I mean, it's kind of disturbing, isn't it? If I think about the Soviet Union and my American guy, and they just sort of say, what do you want? Czechoslovakia? Fine. I don't know, you know? It's a shock. And it was normal then, but... I don't know who's such a Okay, so that's... 
I was actually in Berlin in uh, uh, January, and uh, I didn't have it to, didn't, to, didn't go there. I want to check that out. Everything's like that, though. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good point. I want to take a look at that and see if uh, because I have to turn this into paper, you know. So. Uh,